Hello everyone, and welcome back to our next lecture in our asynchronous microbiology lecture series over bacterial genetics. Um, so as the name implies, this lecture is going to cover bacterial genetics and some of the interesting things that they do to uh, manipulate their genetics and how they transmit around genetics and things like that. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with it. So the first part of this chapter is going to cover um, DNA. Um, DNA replication, how DNA is put together, how to read DNA, uh, transcription, translation, um, and things like that. So transcription and translation and DNA replication, for the most part, are things that you guys have seen hundreds of times um, over and over in Biology 1, um, lots of different times. So I'm going to link a couple of videos below um, in the description of this video to give you guys a refresher on DNA replication and things like that if you want to check those out. If you've got a good handle on that, um, you're good, um, but I will link a couple of videos in the description below um, this video for you guys if you want to check out a couple of things uh, to refresh your memory about how um, DNA replication works. So, um, that being said, transcription and translation, same thing. They work pretty much the exact same with bacteria as they do with eukaryotes. You know, so, uh, it can be the same thing. So, I'll link a couple of uh, videos as well for transcription and translation. You guys have seen this stuff before, how to read a codon chart. Um, so, I'm going to link a couple of videos below. Um, in our description with this video over what uh, transcription and translation is and that things like that. Um, so um, that being said, we're really going to start here um, with this guy, Frederick Griffith. Um, so all the beginning of this chapter is really just how DNA is replicated, what DNA is, you know, um, things that you guys have heard thousands of times in biology courses. Um, so if you want to check out the videos, I'm going to link below. You're more than welcome to. Um, if not, we're going to jump in right here um, with Frederick Griffith. So, um, bacteria themselves. Um, I've talked a little bit about the bacterial capsid before, or capsule, excuse me, um, and that, that um, hard uh, coating on the outside of them um, that can keep them from being a, a eaten, phagocytized by the immune system. Um, so, Frederick Griffith, he was a, a British uh, microbiologist working in the 1920s, um, with the bacteria Streptococcus pneumoniae, in the time it was known as pneumococcus. Um, and he noticed that this particular bacteria came in two different forms. Um, one that had a capsule and one that didn't. Um, and the form that had a capsule on it was able to kill things. Uh, things that had the capsulated form inside of them would die, um, whereas uh, things that didn't have the capsule inside of them, uh, that didn't have the capsule, excuse me, um, were unable to kill things. So he noticed this, and he set about to try to figure out um, what was going on here. And this is kind of one of the first uh, discoveries of bacterial genetic, kind of a, how DNA is uh, sent around from uh, species to species and how it's heritable and things like that, um, and how bacteria can trade that around. Um, so this is a very famous experiment, the Frederick Griffith experiment. And what he did was he took it these two different uh, versions of the bacteria. One of them lacks a capsule, and one of them has a capsule. So the rough strain lacks a capsule, and the smooth strain has a capsule. That's just what he named it, very creative uh, uh, very creative man. Um, so the rough strain, what would happen is he injected this rough strain in a mouse. Now it lacks a capsule, the immune system is just going to destroy it, go straight um, straight to it and kill it. Um, so that bacteria won't be able to do anything realistically inside of the mouse. So that mouse is going to be perfectly fine. It's not going to have any problems. Um, so when you do an autopsy on that mouse or you take a blood sample, you won't find any bacteria inside of it. There's none living there. Um, the immune system's destroyed them all. There's none living there for to, to cause problems inside the mouse. The other strain is called the smooth strain. And the smooth strain has that capsule on the outside of it. And that capsule keeps it from being eaten by the immune system, which means that it can grow unchecked inside of that mouse's body, um, grow and replicate and cause disease. So Frederick Griffiths knew this. Um, and when he did a, uh, an autopsy on this particular mouse, he found this bacteria living inside of it, which is not unexpected. You'd expect that. Um, so he knew this, and he started to wonder if maybe it was the capsule. It kind of makes sense. It's the same species of bacteria. They look the same. They do the same thing. Um, but one of them kills you, and one of them doesn't. Maybe it's the capsule that's caught killing you. Maybe it's the capsule itself. The bacteria aren't different, but maybe it's the capsule itself. So what he did was pretty smart. Um, he took these bacteria, the smooth strains, and he heated them up inside of a, a test tube or a flask or something to the point where they died. They, they, they were dead, but he didn't break open their cells. He didn't boil them. He didn't lice them open, so their capsules were left intact. So the bacteria itself is dead, but the capsule that, if it's causing problems, uh, is still intact, 
um, is going to be injected inside of a mouse. So he did that. He called it the heat killed strain. Um, well, obviously there's nothing living here. Those capsules, as we know nowadays, um, were unable to do anything. The bacteria's capsule was broken down by the mouse's body, the immune system, it's, it's nothing there, um, and were just destroyed and gone away. You do an autopsy on this mouse and there's nothing inside it, which is you know, not unexpected. And then this is where he took it a step farther, which is kind of cool. Now he took this smooth strain that had been killed and the rough strain, which didn't kill anything, and he mixed them together inside of a test tube and he stuck them inside of a mouse. And when he did an autopsy on this mouse, it died, by the way. And when he did an autopsy on this mouse, he found this particular strain of bacteria living inside of this mouse. Now, that's kind of odd. Now, he had no earthly idea what he was looking at. But what he uh, was observing was something that he called the transformation principle. Um, bacterial transformation is what he was observing. Um, and I'll talk about that briefly in just a second. But he was one of the very first persons, uh, first people um, to notice this and to take note of it and to write an experiment um, that, that demonstrated it. Um, the bacteria were able to, you know, um, change their form, transform from one shape to another. Um, and I'll talk about how this works in depth in just a little bit. Um, but this is a very, very famous experiment um, involving the smooth strain um, and the rough strain of the same bacteria, the presence or absence of a capsule, um, and then being able to induce uh, one particular species to grow a capsule or not. Um, now, he called this thing the transformation principle. Now, in reality, it's DNA. Um, it, DNA is what's going to be transferred from one species to another. Um, the bat smooth cells were dead. Um, essentially what happens is their little bodies decay and their DNA falls apart and it's released into the environment. Um, the rough cells uh, that lack that capsule can suck up the little tiny pieces of DNA um, from the environment and then they can use those little tiny pieces of DNA to do things. Um, so essentially what happened is they took in a piece of DNA that, uh, from the, the capsulated version that allowed them to grow a capsule. Very simple uh, explanation. Now he had no earthly idea what the transforming uh, principle was. It's DNA. And that was discovered in 1944 um, by these guys. It was a super cool experiment, um, which I'll link a, a little video about um, in our description below as well. So. Um, I've talked a little bit about bacterial nucleoids, the big cluster of DNA that's uh, in the middle of them, one giant long circle. Um, sometimes it's called the bacterial chromosome, um, things like that, not surrounded by a nucleus at all, uh, no nuclear membrane. Uh, plasmids are another thing that are found in the genetics of bacteria. Now these are cool. Now plasmids are essentially just tiny little circular pieces of DNA that exist independently of the bacterial chromosome or the bacterial nucleoid. The bacteria doesn't have to have these to be a successful bacteria, um, to live, to do everything that it needs to do. But if it does have these plasmids, um, it allows them to do some interesting things. It's kind of like a, a, an add-on, if you like. A, um, you get the baseline bacteria, and then you can get the plus version or the SL plus version um, with different types of plasmids, is essentially what's going on here. Now, bacteria can trade plasmids from species to species, or sorry, from, a, from organism to organism, um, and trade them around quite regularly, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, but these plasmids contain genetic information. It's a little circular piece of DNA um, that can contain some genes that usually encode for some interesting things. Um, so if you get a plasmid from the environment, you don't need these plasmids, but now all of a sudden you've got a plasmid that gives you the genetic ability to produce penicillinase. Ah, oh, you can break down penicillin now. That seems kind of handy. Um, you're not going to die in the presence of penicillin. Or now you can create um, sucrase. You can break down sucrose as a nutrient source. Um, so plasmids are super cool. They're like little add-ons that bacteria can get. Um, and then they can trade them around from species to species. But uh, for, Sorry, from individual to individual. But plasmids are not required by an individual um, bacteria. They're not needed to be a successful bacteria, whereas the nucleoid is. The nucleoid contains all the information that the bacteria is going to need to make a new version of itself, to keep itself running, to be the S version of a bacteria, um, whereas the plasmids don't have any of that information. It's just extra stuff to get you from the S to the SL part, um, the, the power windows and the heated seats thing. That's literally just it. Um, so nucleoids and plasmids are found pretty often um, inside of bacteria, and they both do different things. So bacteria's uh, genetic codes can change. Um, and they can change fairly regularly. Um, but one of the easiest ways to make a, a bacteria's um, um, DNA or their genetic code changes with a mutation. And a mutation is any singular change inside of a bacterial's genetic code. Um, it could be you know, a single change in a nucleotide, a gaining of a nucleotide, a loss of a nucleotide, multiple changes. 
um, all kinds of different things. But any single thing that results in a change in the original nucleotide sequence of an organism um, is termed a mutation. Now some mutations, um, uh, sorry, mutations occur all the time, and there's lots of different reasons why, but some, most of them occur just randomly and naturally throughout your daily life and the bacteria days, little daily life, all kinds of species. Every single species on the planet that has DNA has mutations that occur all the time. And those particular um, ones that occur just randomly throughout the environment, natural mutations, random mutations, and things like that, that's kind of what they're called. Whereas you can cause a mutation to occur in a lab um, or in yourself if you do things that cause DNA damage. In those particular times, they're called induced mutations. Um, and this would be something like uh, you know, people who smoke um, or you know, pouring a chemical on a bacteria that you know causes changes in DNA and things like that. You're inducing mutations to occur. Um, now, sometimes you might want to see how a bacteria reacts to a certain thing to see if it, uh, what the mutations are. Um, or you might want to try to replicate different uh, mutations in the lab that occurred naturally. Um, so lots of different times and lots of different reasons why you might want to replicate mutations. Um, and different types of mutations exist as well. Um, but bacteria replication, DNA replication, is a lot more sloppy than it is in um, things like eukaryotic organisms. They have a lot less DNA. Um, their DNA all matters, whereas we have exon introns and things like that. Um, so if they have a mutation that occurs, it's usually going to be a lot more noticeable than it is in us, and their replication process is a lot more sloppy, which means it tends to be a lot more error-prone than it is in things like eukaryotes. So mutations in bacteria and prokaryotes tend to be a lot more noticeable um, than they are in things like us, whereas our mutations can uh, sometimes just be things called terms silent, which means it is a change in the nucleotide sequence, but it doesn't really matter. Um, it's not positive, it's not negative, it didn't do anything to your body that was a, a good or bad. Whereas in these guys, if they have a mutation, it's almost always going to be either positive or negative. It's going to have some sort of impact on them um, because they don't really have uh, extra DNA to play with. So there's lots of different types of mutations. Um, you have something called point mutations, deletion mutations, insertions, frame shifts, and things like that. Um, I'll link a video uh, of these as well, talking to the different types of mutations. Um, in our description as well. These are super easy, um, these are pretty easy to understand. Point mutations is just a single change in the nucleotide sequence of deletion. You get rid um, of an amino acid and insertion, you insert an amino acid. Um, a frame shift, you get uh, rid of a single nucleotide, which causes the reading frame to shift over one. There are more different types of nucleotides. There's the key to this down here in mutations if you want to read it. Um, but I'll link a video talking through the different types of mutations as well. So wild type mutations occur, um, you know, fairly rarely. Um, but sometimes you want to induce mutations in a lab. I um, mean, you can cause this to happen by lots of different ways, and you're probably familiar with a few of them. Um, things like alcohol that cause liver cancer, you know, things like that. Uh, smoking, um, you know, asbestos, different kinds of cancers, the chemicals and things that cause cancers in humans. Um, and the same kind of thing causes uh, problems in bacteria as well. Um, in a lab, you can expose them to things called mutagens, um, things that encourage mutations to occur, things that cause DNA damage to occur. Um, and there's lots of different reasons why you might want to do this. So chemical agents. There are lots of different things you can pour on bacteria, put in their auger, expose them to, feed them, um, that will change their DNA. Um, alkylating agents, nitrous acid, base analogs, intercalating agents, and they all work in different ways. Um, but essentially what they're going to do is they're going to change the um, structure or the sequence of the DNA in itself. It may change one particular amino acid to a different one or a nucleotide to a different one or something similar to it but not the same. Um, you can see here our intercalating agents causes frame shifts. So lots of different ways to induce and different types of mutations that are induced um, via different chemical agents. This is the same kind of thing that occurs when you smoke um, and things like this. So transposons. Transposons are super cool. These are also called jumping genes. Um, and essentially what a transposon does is if you have a piece of DNA that's got a gene in the middle of it, that gene has to be intact for it to function. The DNA uh, polymerase is going to roll along, RNA polymerase, excuse me, read that whole gene, pump out our RNA, which is going to be made to make a protein. Now transposons, what, you, what they do is they'll jump in the middle of that gene. So you got your DNA, 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 and then all of a sudden you got a transposon in the middle of it. So essentially what you're seeing is you're reading, you're reading, and then all of a sudden there's just junk information in the middle of it, and then you're reading again. 
Um, so the DNA, when it, or the RNA polymerase, when it comes through to make uh, RNA, it reads nice, good thing, junk, nice, good thing. So it's not going to read um, successfully. It's not going to be able to transcribe or transpose, sorry, that um, DNA and RNA, transcribe it. Um, so, it, you know, it's kind of useless when these, these things occur. Transposons jump from their original home in the DNA. Um, they can jump into plasmids. They can jump anywhere they want to that's got a piece of DNA. And they'll jump inside of different genes. And this is just totally random um, where they do this. Um, so if they jump inside of an important gene, it can actually, you know, kill the organism. Um, or, you know, it can cause the, the different types of things to occur where the organism was not able to eat a certain nutrient source or produce a certain thing that it needed. Um, so these transposons can really mess up um, the life of a bacteria for the negative. But sometimes they can be positive. You can jump into a particular gene that causes something different to occur, um, which might be go a good thing. Um, so transposons can be mostly negative for the most part, but sometimes um, they are beneficial. It's just a jumping gene piece of DNA um, that jumps from its original home in a piece in a bacteria to a different home in the different in the DNA. It can jump into a plasmid um, and then transfer from organism to organism. Lots of different ways um, that these things can move around but they jump in and out of DNA and turn off genes if they jump into a gene or not. Radiation. Radiation is a really uh, common way to induce mutations. Um, if you know anything about cancer um, or uh, treatment of cancer, the radiation that they use can sometimes cause more cancer. Um, or if you know anything about like the atomic bombs or anything like that, people come in contact with lots of radiation, which can cause cancer. Um, one of the most common things that it does is it causes something called a thymine dimer to occur. And this occurs when you have two T's that are next to one another in the DNA strain. Um, UV light, or sorry, radiation causes, um, UV radiation causes the DNA bonds to break apart, um, single strands, and then what that happens is the two T's, instead of being bonded to A across, they bond to one another. Um, and it's called a thymine dimer. It causes your DNA to have a kink in it. And then it can't be um, um, replicated properly until this is fixed. Now, sometimes your body can fix this. Uh, and when it does fix this, uh, in humans anyway, it produces something called photomelanin. Um, so this is produced when you get a suntan. Um, when you damage your bond, your body, um, the darker that you're, the, the, you are after your tan, um, the more photomelanin you've produced, the more damage you've induced in your DNA, the more likely it is to, to eventually have problems. Um, your body can fix these in humans and bacteria. It's a little different. Um, in bacteria, or sorry, in humans, when we fix these, like I said, we produce photomelanin, um, but it can cause cancer if these mutations occur. Uh, too many of them, you go to the tanning bed too often, you get too much sun, um, or you know, you don't give enough breaks in between, um, and things like that. Or it just happens to, uh, you know, hit inside of a really important gene which regulates cell replication. So um, this is what occurs when people get too much sunlight, and this thing can also occur in bacteria as well. Um, both of those are bad. So. Um, sometimes you've induced a mutation in a lab. There are lots of different ways to, you know, replicate mutations to ensure that they uh, are mutant mutants. Sorry, um, when you get that mutation finally, there's lots of different things called direct selection and indirect selection. Um, this involves, you know, causing a bacteria to mutate to become immune to something, um, and then you expose it to that thing that it's immune to, um, and then only the one that's resistant will survive, or the rest of them that aren't, you know, mutated won't. And this is the opposite of that one. So there's lots of different ways to do this to get those out. Um, and then our bodies and bacteria have to deal with fixing these mutations. So mutations are not necessarily always a great thing. Um, most of the time, they're silent in humans anyway. They don't do anything. But in bacteria, they're almost always seen in some way, uh, negative or positive. And the bodies um, of bacteria as well as us need to fix those mutations before they're permanent. And there's lots of different ways to do that. Now, DNA polymerase, the enzyme that uh, replicates DNA, makes mistakes from time to time, but it can, uh, you know, proofread itself, and it can fix them from time to time. Um, we have enzymes that go along and fix um, mismatch repairs. If, an enz if the um, DNA polymerase does make a mistake, it'll go fix that. If, you know, if an A bonds to a G, it'll go fix that and put in what it's supposed to have. Um, photomelanin is produced when we fix UV light damage. Um, there's, you know, there's parts of our DNA which will be cut out and new ones will be put in. Um, all of this stuff, is, our bodies have evolved and different species and bacteria and things have evolved to keep themselves from suffering the effects of negative mutations. Um, so to keep their, their genome stable, to 
keep it in one piece to keep it non-changing so they they don't have to worry about um, detrimental effects of mutations so how do bacteria transfer around um, their genetic material from uh, you know, one species to or one organism to another um, now, if you recall, most bacteria, uh, almost all of them for the most part, um, replicate solely by binary fission. That, boop, they replicate their DNA, they make an identical clone of themselves. Um, so how does their DNA change? Other than just simple mutations that can you know, be passed on from binary fission, um, there are other ways that bacteria can have their DNA change um, in the environment, which is super cool. Um, DNA-mediated transformation, which is our... Um, Frederick Griffith experiment, transduction, and a conjugation. And this is what we're fixing to go over. So DNA-mediated transformation. This is super cool. Essentially what happens is this bacteria has an enzyme or uh, a gene inside of it for penicillinase. And this bacteria um, doesn't. So this bacteria is going to die. And when it dies, the genes, the bacteria inside of it, all that stuff, all the DNA is going to be broken down and released into the environment as the cell decays. And sometimes what can happen is this piece of DNA, the gene for penicillinase production, the ability to break down penicillin, make an enzyme that breaks down penicillin, will be released into the environment. And it's going to float around and it's going to land on the surface of this bacteria that doesn't have the ability to break down penicillin. It's going to land on it. And when it does, this little bacteria will take this gene inside, insert it into its DNA, and now it will start making um, penicillinase itself. It will start breaking down penicillin, which is super cool. Um, bringing in naked foreign DNA from the environment um, and using it for yourself, which is super neat to do something. Um, now this is called DNA-mediated transformation. Not every single bacterial cell can do this, and they can't all do this at all uh, at, at this all at the same time, you know, throughout their entire lives. They can only do this at certain points in their lives um, when they're termed competent, and this means that they can bring in foreign DNA. Um, they can't do that their entire lives. They can only do that at certain points. They have a little machinery, um, a little you know, an enzyme or something that catches uh, foreign DNA on the outside of their cells. And unless they have that, they can't do this. And they can only bring in foreign DNA um, that's really closely related uh, or the exact same species as them. Um, if our DNA, you know, they brought in our DNA, they would try to do this, um, and then it would the, their bodies would, or, you know, the little bacterial species would recognize it as you know, too different, they can't read it, um, and then they, they would break it down and destroy it. Um, so only very, very similar DNA to their own or the exact same species DNA, um, this can be done with. But a very cool way... Uh, for bacteria to transfer around DNA and information um, from one another. So this uh, is a very common thing that occurs in the, the environment, um, in water, bodies of water, um, sewer treatment plants, and things like that, where they spread around um, lots and lots and lots of DNA at one time um, to different things. So essentially what happens is once the organism has that gene for penicillinase, it's going to replicate, and then all of its babies will have the gene for penicillinase, and then all of this one's babies will have the gene for penicillinase. So once they get that gene, it's not going away. Um, so really, really, really difficult when it comes to dealing with bacteria when they can become resistant to drugs and things like that, um, antibiotics, so easily. Transduction. So we've got a whole lecture on viruses and how they work. Um, but essentially what happens in this particular case is transduction is the movement of um, DNA from one bacterial species to another bacterial species, or an, another bacteria, um, one, ba one bacterial individual cell to another um, via a virus. Uh, so the virus is going to be the delivery agent to get that piece of DNA from one uh, individual to another. So when viruses, uh, bacteriophages for bacteria, um, invade a host cell, they break down the host cell's DNA. And then the bacteria is, uh, the virus is assembled inside the bacteria. And occasionally what can happen is a small piece of that host cell's DNA can be put inside the virus. Now we'll have a whole lecture over viruses like I mentioned, but they essentially work like um, postage envelopes. They don't have to have anything inside of them as long as there's you know, a, an address and a stamp. Um, and it doesn't matter what's inside. It can be the wrong virus information. They don't care. They're still going to do their job. Um, and this is exactly what happens. So the virus goes, leaves the host cell that it came from with that host cell's DNA inside of it, goes to a new cell, um, and then tries to kill that new host cell, but there's no virus DNA, there's only old bacterial DNA. And then that new bacteria gets a nice new piece of DNA, which sometimes could have something useful on it. 
um, and then this organism can start using it for itself and making whatever that gene encoded for, which is super cool. And now we as scientists know this. We can put our own messages inside of bacteria um, and send them where we want, inside of viruses, sorry, bacteriophages, um, and send them to bacteria, which is super cool. So we can engineer this process ourselves, which is super neat. And then you've got conjugation. Um, this is essentially just bacterial sex. Um, essentially what happens is the bacterial, will, um, a male F positive, now they're not male and female, they don't have that concept. That's termed F positive or F negative. Um, and the F stands for fertility. Um, and it's a fertility plasmid that allows them to produce these things called pelises. Now we've talked about the sex pelis before. Um, it's essentially a big long hollow straw um, that goes from the F positive to the F negative species or, or individual. And what's going to happen is it forms a bridge linking their cytoplasms together. Um, and then what can happen is the F plasmid will go across, making this new cell F positive, but other plasmids can go as well. So if you've got, you know, resistance plasmids for particular antibiotics or things like that, this is how they transfer around. Um, they will, you know, give their plasmids from one species or one individual to the other through that little sex pelis, and that's how they get them. And they can do this really quickly, um, fairly regularly. It happens a lot in gram-negative cells. Um, and this is how they pass around um, their genetic information on plasmids, which is super cool. Very rarely does the actual nucleoid, um, the bacterial chromosome, the uh, genomic information get passed between these, but it can happen. Um, and when that does happen, you get some very interesting things to occur. But most of the time, this is how plasmids are spread around um, from species to, or from individual to individual. Um, so lots of different ways that bacteria can do this, and it's super cool. Um, transduction, trans, uh, tran uh, all these things have been observed um, in nature. Uh, transduction is not the most common thing, but all these things have been observed in, in nature, in the lab. They they're all occur... Um, fairly regularly, and they all lead to different types of outcomes. Um, this is what's caused, uh, you know, different types of mutations have led to our antibiotic resistant problems. Um, but this is the, bacteria are constantly evolving, um, and these type mutations and things like that um, allow their evolution to move forward. Um, so this is all I've really got over this one. A lot of this chapter is review. Um, so once again, I'll link those videos below for DNA replication um, if you want to check that out. Um, other than that, um, that's all I've really got for this particular uh, PowerPoint. If you guys have any questions uh, or anything else you'd like to know, please let me know. Um, other than that, have a great rest of your week.